Sean, what came first, the decision to make the movie Tangerine or the decision to shoot on an iPhone? The decision to uh, make Tangerine came long before the decision to shoot on the iPhone. Um, that was a... Uh, shooting on the iPhone was something that we eventually got to because when we started budgeting the film and looking at how we were going to make this on the limited budget that we had, that option eventually arose. So I, uh, I'd say the idea of Tangerine came long before. And also to the beauty of the iPhone being less uh, conspicuous than using this? Right, I wish that I could say that I, I knew about all the benefits that the iPhone was going to reveal to us. And yeah, I, I wish I knew about, no, well, I'm sorry, let me start over. Um, I, I, I wish I, I could say that I, I was going about this intentionally and, and I was going to embrace all of the benefits that the iPhone would be giving us, but quite honestly, a lot of those benefits were revealed to us while we were shooting. Um, and we just, we just took advantage of them and then we made the most of what we had. But, um, but it was, it was really started from a place of like a budgetary constraint. Yeah. Did anyone try to talk you out of shooting on an iPhone? Oh, most uh, definitely. Uh, we had many people, you know, uh, when I, when I mentioned it for the first time to some of my producers, you know, all the eyebrows were being raised. I mean, I, I even had to con I was trying to talk myself out of it to tell you the truth I, I um, and once I convinced myself then I had to convince the rest of the crew but we did it by doing tests we, we shot a lot of tests and um, at one point Technicolor was nice enough to allow us to bring some footage over there and blow it up on the big screen to present it to our financiers and our producers and just know that this thing would hold resolution look presentable on the big screen. And, and forgive me, when I came over today, I was thinking that it was one of the first few films to be shot on a, a feature film, mm. but apparently it's not, and, and that's nothing that you've ever made a statement on. You've always said right. actually that's um, not true. I don't know how many films have been shot on the iPhone, a handful, maybe, maybe, maybe even two, I, I'm not sure. But I do, uh, we never said we were one of the I mean, we never said we were the first iPhone movie. I actually know the makers of another one called King Kelly that came out in 2012 that was at South by Southwest. And it's a wonderful movie. It's, it's very different. But uh, they shot on an earlier version of the iPhone. Um, and they were going for a very different aesthetic. But we can say that we are the first iPhone film shot in true scope. Okay. Yes because we had the anamorphic adapters given to us by Moondog Labs. Oh, nice, okay. And so how does that work with the lens, like on the iPhone? Well, we, um, I, first off, I, I found them because of a Kickstarter campaign. They were in their prototype stage and they were just trying to get money to actually get this product up and out there, right? So um, I reached out to them and um, they, they were, I had to drop Mark Duplass's name, of course, and uh, but they were very happy to lend us three of their prototypes. They sent them over. Basically, what it does is that you're still using the iPhone lens. It's just an adapter that fits over the lens and allows you to capture your image anamorphically. So um, you uh, once you when you're actually looking at the image on the iPhone, which is basically our monitors on set, everything is squished. So you know how in the old days you would watch a film on television, you watch a western, and everything during the credit sequence had to be squished in order to read everything. That's how everything looked while we were shooting. We always had to imagine what the frame would look like once it stretched out. Then when you get home and you're in post-production, you get the footage on your computer, you're able to stretch it out and see the way that the final product will be. So yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was, it was interesting. Uh, we. Radium and I, Radium Chung and I, we co-shot the film. Radium Chung was, is, a, is a wonderful cinematographer and, and, and solo shot my previous film, Starlet. Um, we shared duties this time just because of uh, schedule. And also we wanted, we both wanted to be camera operators on this. Um, but anyway, he, um, we were joking around on set about how we had to get so used to imagining what the final frame would look like and how it would stretch out 
Um, but then we thought, you know, that's how it was done back in the day. I'm sure that's how Sergio Leone was doing it, you know, where he would have to look at probably a squished image. They didn't have the technology to, to, to have monitors on set and stretch this thing out properly. I mean, so it's, we we're doing the same thing that people were doing only like 30, 40 years ago. So it was fine. But were there certain things then that when you did look at the stretched image, you realized, oh, you know what, we, we need to go back and shoot that because we missed some mm. little vital thing or no? For the most part, we were okay. Okay. We were okay. okay. And remember, there were only a few shots in which we had to be incredibly accurate with framing um, because uh, the film still has sort of a docu thing going on which allowed for handheld material. So, you know, you could always be s slightly, you didn't have to be absolutely perfect. There were a few uh, segments within the film that are, that are locked down and in, the, in which the framing is extremely precise and calculated. And, that, and in those cases, no, we were fine. I think by the time we got to those sections, we were pretty confident we knew what we were doing. That being said, do you think you'll go back and shoot another film? Uh, on the iPhone? Um, no, 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 no. Well, I mean, you never know where you're going to be. Uh, but. Um, I enjoyed the experience and it was fine and I, I know that already in the in the in the last year and a half uh, you know the technology has advanced to the point where you can already and and the app that we used which is called filmic pro that's already on another version or two since we shot and you can capture 3k on it and so already in the year and a half advancements has taken place within the iPhone you know uh, uh, filming community and 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 devices. I mean, I'm sorry, and um, apps and tools that you can actually, you know, get something uh, better than what we got. But at the same time, uh, I do fall into the camp of if you can shoot film, shoot film. That's that's me. I just haven't been able to for the last couple of films because of budget. My goal is always to try to get the budget to shoot on celluloid again before it goes away entirely. So that's what I'm trying to do with the next film, uh, you know, but well, you never know, you can never say. Sure. I mean, if you asked me while I was making Starlet, if I would be shooting the next film on an iPhone, I would be outraged. I would, <laughs> you know, there'd be no <laughs> way in the world I would have considered it. It actually, the whole reason that this came about is, um, Tangerine in general, is because uh, for a year and a half after Starlet, I was waiting for a much bigger budget film to happen and it was a completely different subject matter and it was a full script that was ready to go that we were looking for a cast for but it's very hard to get cast without financing and it's very hard to get financing without cast so we were in this terrible cycle that kept going on for about a year and a half until the point where I knew I had to make something uh, or I would just be sitting around for the rest of my life. So I called up uh, Mark Duplass and I said, you know, a couple years ago you, you put it out there that you would like to executive produce a micro budget for me. Is that offer still on the table? And he said, yeah, what's your idea? And I said, Santa Monica and Highland, I think you might know the intersection. He said, yeah, yeah, get me a treatment and we'll talk about it. So just real quickly, when, when you realize that this other one may not happen because you were caught in this weird zone. What was that like before you said, you know what, I, I need to get something going here fast? Like, what, what do you go through? Well, to tell you the truth, it, it came down to two things. Uh, I looked at a lot of filmmakers around me uh, who were being quite prolific at the time. In particular, I, I looked at uh, the cinema of like uh, Joe Swanberg, and I just was very impressed with how fast he was making films. Also, the Korean director Kim Ki Duk, he was just seemed to have one every year, and um, so I thought, you know, that they're they're because they were so prolific, they've actually they've gotten attention for this, and and the people who weren't making things were slowly falling off the radar and I felt I was slowly falling off the radar so this was a a desperate move for me to to continue working number one and number two I went to um, I was I was still on the tail end of the Starlet um, festival run because you know that can actually run up to two years sometimes you know it's really because um, 
you'll still get requests from film festivals almost two years down the line. And so, and I love to travel with film festivals. It's very important to me because making these independent films, there really isn't any money in these, uh, in these movies. And the compensation for me is travel and seeing the world. Anyway, I got to go to New Zealand. Wonderful film festival. Absolutely like wonderful programming because they're shortly after Cannes. So they get a lot of the Cannes titles. So I'm there just for two weeks watching all these movies. But then I started watching all, of course, the, you know, the big can titles. But then all of a sudden, uh, I found myself also watching a lot of the smaller independents, like a lot of the Australian indies. And, and, I, and they were made for very little. And, and I thought, you know, these, these are inspiring me. You know, why not make another small film? I mean, I was, I was looking. There were a lot of first and second time films in this selection. And... And I, was, I just loved how it seemed like there was that spirit that these filmmakers had with their films of like just getting out there for the first time and doing it no matter what, no matter, you know, with the very little money they had. And I thought, you know, that's basically where I'm at. I'm on my fifth film, but still I'm, I'm, I have to retain that spirit or I'll die. So it was, it was that it was at the New Zealand Film Festival that I remember making the decision saying, I'm going to go back to the States and I'm going to now focus on a whole new project. And that's why I give the entire staff of the New Zealand Film Festival thanks in the end credits of Tangerine. How much did marketing factor into your decision to shoot on the iPhone? We, actually, it didn't factor into it whatsoever. I mean, we couldn't even get, we got, I think we reached out to iPhone at one point to see if they would even lend us or give us iPhones to shoot. And perhaps, I think wh whatever department we reached out to didn't, uh, they declined. I think it was probably because of the subject matter, um, being the fact that it was uh, focusing on sex work. So um, we knew that perhaps the, the film would get um, attention because of it or to a certain degree, but it wasn't um, in any way calculated or planned. It wasn't something, for example, uh, the most, we, we really wanted to actually keep it out of the news until we premiered it at Sundance. We didn't want people going into Sundance thinking, oh, I'm gonna go see this iPhone movie. We, we, nobody knew actually until the very end of the film when in the final credits it says shot in the iPhone 5S. And that was the first time anybody outside our small circle knew that this film was shot on that. So then when you do the Q&A yeah. afterward, right. were most of the questions directed toward? No, 50-50. Right. Oh, uh, right okay. now, what seems to happen in these Q and A's is that 50% of it is about the tech, and then 50% about of it is about the trans movement and how we approached that sensitive subject matter and being from outside that world, how we decided to to actually form a story, work with our with our actors, and and uh, and make this film. Is there a way you could share? Like take five minutes to share with any filmmakers sure. that have never shot with the iPhone. They sure, want to sure. shoot a feature film. Sure. Um, there are a few things I'd recommend. First off, um, every film is different, so I I, I sometimes don't like uh, giving advice because if I do, I'm talking about one particular aesthetic. You know what I mean? So, but but if there are a few things that I would suggest filmmakers uh, do if they're using on the if they're using the iPhone and one of them is get a stabilizer if you try to hand hold an iPhone it really does look terrible in my eyes you may want to go for that look but because the lens is so tiny no matter how stable you think you might be the human hand shakes and that translates pretty poorly when it gets onto the big screen there's a wobbly sort of uh, this this very unattractive shakiness that's um, that can be fixed if you have a stabilizer so we used a smoothie which is uh, that's what it's called it's a smoothie by Steadicam and Tiffin and it's really just a little grip it's about an eight inch grip and um, and, it, and it's a Steadicam for an iPhone uh, so that and then also sound you know sounds very important on any production I get a lot of uh, Twitter messages and Facebook messages asking me how I recorded on the iPhone. And I say, I didn't record on the iPhone. We, we recorded 
professionally, separately, and we sunk in post. You know, Iron Strauss had a full, who was our sound recordist, wonderful, um, very talented um, uh, artist. He, he basically was able to, he recorded everything the way he would normally record on any feature film with his digital unit and his hot, very high quality mics, both, uh, you know, both shotgun mics and lavaliers, and then we sunk in post. And that's very important because, you know, uh, audience will, uh, they can accept anything visually because that is sort of like this aesthetic that you're presenting to the audience. But with the sound isn't there, the sound isn't crisp and easy to hear and understand, it's, it's a no-go. So spend money on, on your sound and do it properly. Um, and those are the two things that I would say will get you technically there. And then just in terms of just generally approaching um, iPhone filmmaking, I would say we're at such an early stage of using, you know, almost like devices that aren't cameras to make films that you can do whatever you want. That's the thing. That's uh, we just experimented and we just said what benefits are to be found here. And let's just try different things. You know, you can get this little a device into a, into nooks and crannies that you wouldn't be able to get you know a big camera into you can you can uh, they're so lightweight you can move them easily you can uh, throw them on a drone and, and and get your nice aerial shots you can do whatever you want um, we just you know we we just started experimenting there during production and and tangerine is what resulted but I'm sure you know uh, a filmmaker out there who uh, you know just wants to to um, to, to come up with their own aesthetic, it's very easy to because it's it's ve it's it's quite this thing is is actually uh, look at it, I'm just throwing it around right now. I'm not you can't do that with a 35 millimeter camera. That's the big difference. What's the first day like writing a screenplay for you when you when you have these different ideas in mind? Uh, That's Starlet, funny. Take Bec out because today was basically one of those days. Oh great, that perfect. Timing. I just got off the phone before you came over. Um, you know, I, I can't even, I mean, I, it's just throwing ideas around at first. And Chris Bergash, who co-wrote Starlet and Tangerine, he's wonderful at, you know, note-taking. So he's there typing away, just compiling every note possible into something. I don't know, even know what he's typing, what, you know, simple text or something. And he's just t compiling all these notes. So the first day is really just us brainstorming, spitballing ideas. Right. But but there must be something in you that's like, okay, I think I'm ready to commit a good two plus maybe years of my life to this. And so you, you're, uh, you're already set on the idea yeah. and you, you, you know that you want to do it. So then you're sort of stream of consciousness thinking and he's taking notes. And then at some point, how do you formulate that into like a first page? Uh, that's really hard to say because it ta it's over the course of many months you know so i i i think there there's a point where there are enough notes down on page and you you understand your story enough where it's time to start writing those pages so uh, i might write a page he'll write a page we'll start sharing them i know that we used uh for both films i think we used google drive and we were sharing a lot that way you know, we also go about it where we eventually get to a point where we we have the um, the post-its on the wall, and that that that's when you when you actually can get a film or your idea or your you know your script um, up on the wall and like with hundreds of post-its and it makes sense from beginning to end, I think that's when we decide to start assigning each other pages and scenes. So we'll say, okay, look at that scene. I think I got a handle on that scene. I'll take that. Can you take that one? Because I don't have a handle on that one. And then we, we share them and then we start to compile this thing. And uh, that's, how that's, that's how that's done. <laughs> what would you say is the most important part of the screenwriting process for you? Whether it's creating that conflict, whatever, 10 minutes, half hour in to the opening, whatever it is, mm. the third act. Yeah, that's really a difficult question. Um, 
Would you say you know the ending? I almost always know the endings of every one of these movies before we even set down the road to, you know, to start breaking it, breaking it out point by point. I mean, I knew the ending of Starlet. I knew the ending of Tangerine. I know the ending of the next film. Um, so that's because I just, I, I think endings are very important to me. Um, Prince, same goes for Prince of Broadway and Takeout. So with all of them, I knew the ending was almost more important than the beginning. This is the first time I'm thinking about this sort of stuff. So, so uh, I haven't been asked these questions before. So, uh, but yeah, no, I think it's actually, I focus more on the last scene and the impact the last scene will have. That's almost one of the first things I think about. You know, with Tangerine, it was the only thing we thought about. When I went to, you know, to start our research process, um, Chris Bergash and I uh, went to the corner of Santa Monica and Highland and we started introducing ourselves to people, et cetera, you know, just telling them what we we're gonna do. When we finally found Maya and Kiki, I said, I only have like a few ideas here. And one of them is, well, first off, uh, uh, it has to take place on one day because we have a limited budget and costume changes cost money and continuity costs money. It's easier to shoot in a, tw in a, a film that takes place in a 24 hour period of time. The second one is that I think people are coming together or someone's trying to find somebody else or whether that's a love story or a revenge story, I don't know. And the third is this ending. I know I can see the ending. I can see all my characters converging at the end at donut time in a big climactic scene. Those were the only things I saw going into it. So it's funny, yeah, it's funny you say, it's funny you bring that up. I, the endings are very important to me because it's about how the audience leaves the theaters, you know? I, 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 I think very much so about the impact of that last scene. If you think, I, I look at my favorite films and my favorite films are like uh, Harold and Maude and when he's walking away at the end after, you know, the the car goes over the cliff and you think he might be in it, but then he's up on the cliff and he's with his, his banjo. Uh, you have, um, you know, some, most of my favorite films have such um, incredibly memorable lasting scenes that have an impact on the audience as they're sitting there during the final credits. And I think that that's something I'm always conscious of. It's, 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 it's the most important thing for me in a screenplay. Looking back on the five feature films that you've made, you've also worked on a few television series. What year or what years would you say were the toughest on you where you thought, you know what, this is too hard and I'm gonna have to find something else to do. This isn't as glamorous as I thought it would be or my wanting to tell a story, this is too emotional for me. Oh, that's interesting, that's an interesting question. I, uh, I think, because almost every time you wrap up a film there's that period between between films that you're losing confidence like every day after the release of the f first time you've premiered at a festival and the confidence level starts to go down of like how am i going to continue this what's going i'm never going to ever make another film again oh my god maybe i'm not you know I, I've, I'm a good barista, so I could always go that way. Uh, but, I, um, but then, of course, then the film gets released in theaters and your confidence level goes back up. But then every day after the release date, it slowly goes down. So I, I, I have to say that it's not just one time or one year. It's always post-release of the film that you're most vulnerable and you're most insecure, at least for me. Would you say it gets progressively more emotional with each film that you've done? It depends on the subject matter. Okay. You know, um, I think that this film was, for me, uh, very, it was, it, it took its toll. It was, an, uh, it really was because of the world that we were working in and um, the fact that we were working with real people off the streets sometimes. Not our leads, but you know, there were others in the film that were actually coming from that world um, and the hardship that they've had to deal with and poverty. And 
you know, that this, this film took its toll. Do you have advice for other filmmakers or even actors who are going through that, they've come off something that's successful, but as each day happens within the 24-hour news feed, their thing gets buried more and more and more. I kind of understand what you're saying. I, I'm dealing right now with, because well, things have changed over the years, the way that you get feedback from people and audience members, uh, critics, etc. It's, it's changed. Now it's all about social media. In the past, you had to wait for printed, uh, you know, uh, reviews, etc. Now you're, at, or, or get, you know, during Q and A's, you would find out what people think. Now it's literally like <laughs> I get a tweet seconds after the movie, uh, uh, you know, as soon as the lights came up in the theater. So I am, uh, you know, I deal with that a lot because I focus on the negative uh, reactions. It's just some, that's my personality. I, I haven't even, there are some wonderful reviews and people are telling me, haven't you, you haven't read that review yet? I'm like, no, I'm focusing on the, the rotten tomato, not the fresh <laughs> tomato. Um, it's, it's something, it's just masochistic or something. But I, but, um, and you're right though, about the way that things get, the positivity might get buried by suddenly a, lo a load of negative tweets, but then the positive ones come back. So it's, you gotta, I'm starting to, be able to cope, but um, but what can you do? You're not going to please anyone, everyone. And then on top of that, it's like I I look at the films that I love, my favorite films, and they've divided audiences, you know, fifty fifty. I mean, there are some of my favorite films people have walked out at or booed at a can, you know, and so I can't concern myself with pleasing every single person and plus the subject matter that we're normally covering with my films they uh, they fall uh, along a, a political uh, viewpoint and if you're not and if there are going to be plenty of people there who don't agree with me politically on some of these movies it's just a simple fact and and so that'll divide people and it's something that I can't get too concerned about I'm it's just it's it's the way things are so well, no I get it anybody myself included can call themselves a blogger or, mm. or a journalist and just mm. put up their own yeah and and have no sort of merit yeah. to, to do that um, I guess what I'm saying is any advice for that in between time where you kind of say to yourself wow was this my peak because I oh, think there's yeah. a scary moment yeah. and and so much of LA is you're right. only as good as your last whatever. Oh yeah, and of so course. how do you deal with that? Was well, there that's, something that you know, that's you? that's mm -hmm. a scary thing. It's a it's a I must say it's it's a scary thing. I mean, you are always looking to top the last film you have or whatever your project is. Or if you're a comedian, your last set. If you're a musician, your your last show. Uh, it's it's. Um, you have to always strive for that. You're not going to try, you don't try to match the last one. You try to beat the last one, you know, because at least, you know, you've put, you've put your all into it. Um, I, um, that was a big deal with this film because the fact that we had to actually, we didn't, it was half the budget, less than half the budget of my previous film. Tangerine was less than half the budget of Starlet. Then all of a sudden we found ourselves shooting on the iPhone. It got to the point where I think in some of, some people's eyes, we were going to make a film that was less than the one before. But see, I, I, um, I read one review that actually kind of, I'm affected by reviews. Uh, I am, I'm sorry, I'm, that's just me. And there was one review that said that Starlet was less ambitious than Prince of Broadway, which I didn't agree with, but that did affect me. So this film was intentionally more ambitious than Starlet, or at least I attempted more ambition. So, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm vulnerable that way. What can you do? Sure. But, but I did, but, um, but, but they're getting back to the iPhone thing. It does relate to what I just said, because I won't say who said this, but somebody said this when I asked them to come work on Tangerine and I said, we were shooting on the iPhone. And this was after I already had convinced myself that it was okay. They said, okay, Sean, yeah, I'll come to LA and play with you. And I said, no, 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 you can't use that word play. Please don't use that word play because 
if we look at it that way, we're going to fail from day one. You know, we have to look at this film as just as important as anything else we're doing. And we have to strive to make this thing as good, if not better, than the previous one. So the play word, no. <laughs> we're not playing here. That was, uh, so, so that, but that always, that, that, that way of thinking has to be applied to every film out there, you know. Do you have anything you do to get you out of sort of the industry for an hour and then come back to it? Because sometimes it, social media, it's like I have to Right. Turn it off. I know. It's you know true. Anything? It's true. Knitting. No. I, on macrame. top, it's funny because I'm also a cinephile and I try to watch a film a day. So I'm still in cinema, even if I'm not working on my own thing, I'm watching somebody else's thing. Mm -hmm. So it becomes to the point where it's, it's sensory overload. Um, that's again why I try to you know travel with these film festivals because that gives me a break that gives me a break where I get to be put somewhere I've never been before and I get to explore a place a city usually where it's like oh, it's a whole new it's a, that's my moment of a break and removing myself but on a daily basis a hike a hike up at Runyon Canyon which is about you know a quarter of a mile that direction I go there with my dogs and my girlfriends so that's uh, that's a nice break where you have an hour and a half of shutting off. Well, I have to admit, sometimes I look down on my phone, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's where we're at these days. These this 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 device has unfortunately made us. I think this entire society have a a case of ADD because we're we c it's very difficult to go more than. 20 minutes without looking at it uh you're you have this internal yeah i know i'm sorry uh you have this internal alarm clock that wakes you i got now this is crazy this is scary and this is where i think i may need to go off the grid for a little while but two nights ago when it was you know that was we're, we're speaking right now on the monday after the release of my film which was on friday i think on friday night i woke up my body woke myself up at 3 a.m. just to check Twitter. That's how, yeah, that's to see wow. the sort of reactions I'm getting. So it's, it's something that is very different from the way you, you used to, you know, get reactions about your work. And it's something that I don't know whether that's a good thing. It can't be a good thing if your body's waking you up at 3 a.m. in the morning. You know what I'm saying? So it can be, I think it, it can get a little dangerous. We're all going to have to learn how to live with you know, constantly being plugged in. And also, too, there's a constant state of comparison going on. Because if yes. we're not looking at our own thing, we're looking at, oh, this was said by this actor about this actor yes. or whatever. Yeah. And we're feeding into yeah. that mindset. You know what I, you know what I, I've, I've the, when I, the, my, I don't, I think competition is, is, is ridiculous. Meaning in terms of like getting jealous about somebody else's achievements that you should I think in this I think in this independent film community we have we're all making such different movies it doesn't matter we should all be supportive of one another and and be happy that we're all getting our visions out there I mean I uh, you know I love the fact that I um, I'm making very different films from you know the Safdie brothers from the guys at Borderline from uh, you know, uh, all the other wonderful filmmakers that, you know, I was just at Sundance with this year. And we're making very different movies, but yet I think we respect each other's stuff. And, and like, uh, and, and we're just happy that we're able to all continue down that, this road of like trying to, you know, to see what we can do with this generation with, uh, with cinema. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's it's nice to see that it's nice to see that's why i live in los angeles now because i see this sort of like independent film community getting very supportive and growing and uh here in the city and and um in that sense of uh community i haven't really seen for a while we're nowhere near like the collectives that existed in like the 70s and stuff like that or but but it would be nice if we got there Sean, what's the most or one of the most exciting moments you've had as a filmmaker? There have been many exciting moments over the years, but there is this one small moment I had by myself while living in New York a few years ago. I used to go down to Chinatown 
go to Grand Street and go through all the bootleg imports and see what I could find from new Asian cinema because it's sometimes hard to find, you know. And uh, I found a copy of Takeout, which was nice. <laughs> you know, I felt like I made it. You know, my film was bootlegged over there and made it all the way back, <laughs> back to me. And now I'm I'm purchasing a, a bootleg of my own film, and I, um, it just was like, uh, okay, good. I, I the film got out there. Now, of course, I shouldn't be so happy that my film was bootlegged, but at the same time, when you're making these little movies, it's just nice to know that you know it's getting outside your living room. <laughs> Did, and you bought that copy? I actually went up to the woman at the counter. I'm like, "This is my film. This is my film. That's my name. Can I? Can I at least like have this one?" And she no, she didn't. Let me, she she didn't mind. even know what I was talking about. Really, there's a language barrier. But at the same time, I I did pay for it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, let's see other exciting moments. Um, that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah, I I mean the, the, this last, I have to say with Tangerine though, you may want to bring it back to Tangerine. Tangerine, for me had very many exciting moments um you know our premiere at sundance our you know just the the days of getting a nice reaction to the film um those 12 days at sundance were just it was just a whirlwind but just recently a week and a half ago when we were in new york city doing uh preparing for the release of the film uh kiki and maya came to new york and we actually had magnolia made us a float a tangerine float for the pride parade and it was really just this wonderful moment where you know kiki who had not who's never been outside of southern california you know was suddenly experiencing manhattan from this elevated point of view and you you couldn't ask for more than that. I mean, I was just so happy that, you know, Kiki was there and being able to experience this wonderful moment. And, and I thought I was like, in a way, like experiencing the moment through her because I couldn't imagine seeing Manhattan that way for the first time with thousands of people cheering you on on either side of, of Fifth Avenue. And, and so it's just an incredible moment. 